is Karen Grant, and I'm the president of the Board of Directors of the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce. And welcome to uh, the first in a series of four of the 2019 federal election presentations hosted by the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce. Over the next two weeks, we'll host four of the candidates in our riding, and full details can be found on our website. All the candidate presentations will happen right here at Planet Hatch, same time and same format. We are video recording all the presentations and we will post them on our website once the series is complete. A big thanks to our sponsors for the series, Planet Hatch for the venue and the Real Estate Board of Fredericton area for the snacks. Your support is very much appreciated. We will also be launching our Questions of the Count series in the next day or two, providing each of the candidates a series of questions and they all are going to receive the same set of questions so that our members and the public can easily compare the, and contrast the positions of each of the candidates on issues that matter to Fredertonians. So to kick things off today, we're very pleased to have Matt DeCorsi, the Liberal Party of Canada candidate, here with us this morning. So look mobilization and outreach background. On October 19, 2015, he became the youngest MP in the history of Fredericton to be elected. As an elected official, Matt has led local consultation sessions and discussion sessions with stakeholders on various topics, including federal budget priorities for the region, the establishment of Canada's innovation agenda, national defense policy, climate change, jobs, developing a national housing strategy, and democratic reform. In October 2016, he founded the Fredericton Youth Council. Matt has also worked as an overseas recruiter for St. Thomas University and as an aide to two MPs. He holds a Master's in Public Relations from Mount St. Vincent University and a Bachelor of Arts from St. Thomas University. He was the Action Canada Fellow in 2012. In addition, he volunteered as Director of the YMC at Fredericton, President of the St. Thomas University Alumni Association, Board Member of Administration of CISV Fredericton, and Provincial Coordinator of the Canadian Commission for UNESCO Youth Advisory Group. Please welcome Fredericton MP, Matt DeCorsi. <laughs> Just once Mr. DeCorsi finishes his remarks, we will open the floor to a Q&A period. So here we go. Well, thank you so much, Karen. Um, Thank you to the entire chamber community. Uh, Krista, to you and your entire team, I see you all of the are here this morning, uh, and, and the members of the board. Uh, thanks for all the partnership over the last four plus years. It's been um, a tremendous learning experience for me, but also a tremendous pleasure to work with you to help advance the priorities of this community and of this region, and I've thoroughly enjoyed our chance to meet regularly, uh, to discuss topics of interest, and to help actually get some important things done for this community. And, uh, and I'm here today to talk about uh, what we've accomplished, our plan moving forward. And I'm also here to talk about how excited I am at the prospects of continuing to work with you to help advance the economic and social opportunity for folks in our greater region. Alors, je vous remercie tous. Merci de tout ce que vous faites. Uh, pour notre croissance économique ici à Fredericton, au Nouveau-Brunswick et dans la région de l'Atlantique. Um, C'est parce que de vos efforts que nous avons une stratégie de croissance uh, pour l'Atlantique, que nous voyons une croissance de notre population et nous le voyons uh, en si grand nombre ici à Fredericton. I want to start by uh, acknowledging that we're here on unceded traditional Wolstokwe territory. And, uh, and I wanted us to think back to four years ago, where we were. Four years ago, I asked for your support so that together we could reject austerity and cuts and instead move forward in a plan that would invest in people, in this community and the communities around us, and in the economic development of Atlantic Canada. And the results speak for themselves. The Atlantic growth strategy, a strategy that was built with you in mind, is breathing new life into our communities. And we're seeing firsthand that our plan is working for our region and that it's working for all of Canada. Across the country, 
more Canadians at work, pushing unemployment to 40-year lows and creating 1.1 million new jobs. And in Fredericton, we continue to see one of the lowest unemployment rates for a community our size in the country. And we're seeing positive job growth because of important investments in infrastructure and investments in the innovative ecosystem that we see all around us. Canadians have more money in their pockets. And in Fredericton, in 2019, a typical family has $4,000 more each year than they had in their pockets in 2015. And that's more money to invest in your businesses and in the local economy. 900,000 fewer Canadians across this country are living in poverty, 300,000 of whom are children, and almost 60,000 of whom are seniors. And in a community and in a province that is seeing ourselves age faster than many other regions across the country, that means more of our parents and our grandparents, the people who helped build this community for us, living better off. And right across Canada, we have one of the strongest economies and strongest records of growth and investment amongst our G7 partners. But while real progress has been made, we know that Canadians and Canadian businesses and many of the small and medium-sized businesses that make the Atlantic economy hum are still facing challenges. But unlike Andrew Scheer and the Conservatives, we understand that addressing these concerns means stepping up further instead of cutting back. Now, as I've said, together we've accomplished great things for our community. And I'd like to keep working together so that Fredericton continues to be a model for the rest of this country as a, places, as a place for businesses to invest, to grow, and to create jobs. And since 2015, we've taken meaningful action to support business competitiveness. We lowered the small business tax rate from 11% to 9%, the lowest in the G7. We created the new accelerated investment incentive to support new business investment. And we've taken action to make Canada's regulatory system simpler, fairer, and more modern. Taken together, these actions mean that Canadian businesses now have the lowest tax rate on new investments in the G7. But there's more to do, and we can do more, to cut expenses for your businesses and help make them more competitive. A re-elected Liberal government will cut corporate taxes in half for businesses that develop and manufacture zero emission products. We'll eliminate the swipe fee on HST credit transactions and get rid of all fees for services for federal agencies such as BBC, EDC, and Farm Credit Canada, services that many of the businesses in our community use to stay competitive. But while cutting taxes and lowering costs is important, we know that it's not the whole story. You need the human capital, the skilled workforce, to meet your labor demands. And whether it's making sure that hardworking people in our community, hardworking Canadians, are equipped with the skills that they need to fill these jobs, or investing in our immigration system, we've taken significant action to help get this done. The new youth employment strategy has brought youth employment down to a record low. More young people are working in the economy than at any point in our history, and the Canada Train benefit is giving workers the time and the money to keep their skills up to date and in demand. And we answered your call to increase economic immigration in our region with an Atlantic immigration pilot that has seen employers offer nearly 4,000 jobs to skilled newcomers. A re-elected Liberal government will build on this momentum. A new Canadian apprenticeship service will help thousands of apprentices finish their training on time, and a $100 million investment in skills training will ensure that there are enough qualified workers to keep up with our historic investments 
in retrofits and in net zero home construction. And we will make the Atlantic Immigration Pilot a full-time program. And with your continued leadership, we will continue to grow our community, our economy, through people. And in Canada's startup capital community, home to Canada's most entrepreneurial university, our plan to provide 2,000 entrepreneurs with $50,000 to launch their businesses means more jobs and more opportunities for the very people that are supported by places like Planet Hatch. Infrastructure is also a key piece of making our businesses more competitive. And I was pleased that the business community led the charge to make the case for much needed investments and renovations to the Fredericton International Airport. Don't take for granted that it was your advocacy and your work rowing together that led to my federal cabinet colleagues making federal regulatory changes to make this project eligible for funding. And I'm excited to line up with you again to bring significant federal funding to our world-class world and growing cybersecurity ecosystem the same way that we have brought significant funding to the development of smart grid technology here in Fredericton. These investments are creating, and will create, more jobs and even more investment in our public transit, our water and wastewater upgrades, and the recreational and cultural infrastructure that the community needs to continue to be growing, vibrant, and diverse. And as we connect more communities to high-speed internet, these enhancements in physical and digital infrastructure will help get your products and your services to new markets. And with new trade deals, more of those products are getting to their destination free of tariffs and other barriers. It was a Liberal government that negotiated new trade deals with the United States, the European Union, and Asia Pacific countries. And Atlantic Canadian businesses are now connected to 1.5 billion consumers in over 50 countries. For example, our Atlantic lobster has seen a 345% increase in exports to Spain in the first year of CETA application alone, and a 35% growth in France. And because of our Atlantic growth strategy mission to China, local businesses like Red Rover and Corey Nutrition are making inroads on the demands driven by a burgeoning middle class in that country. Canada is now the only G7 country to have trade agreements with every other G7 country. And we want to build on this. A re-elected Liberal government will make free trade within Canada a reality and continue to help Canadian businesses grow and export to new markets. With lower taxes, new trade deals, and key investments in immigration, skilled labor, <coughs> innovation, we're helping businesses grow, stay competitive, and create good jobs. And we have great momentum because we've been able to work together to stand up for businesses in this region and right across the country. And we need to continue working together because Andrew Shear would put all the progress we've made at risk. He won't say what programs and services he'll cut. And like Doug Ford, he'll cut the services and programs that Atlantic Canadians and Atlantic Canadian businesses rely on. Cuts that would hurt our regional economy and cause severe job losses. And we can't let that happen. Our economy is strong and growing, and our Atlantic growth strategy is making a difference, breathing new life into our communities. We have a solid reputation as a good place to invest and do business, and that reputation is on the line. I want to thank you again for the chance to be here and for what we've been able to do together over the last four years. And I hope that as you think about the choice, the important choice that we have to make this year, that you'll choose to move forward. To move forward for people in this community, for people in our region, 
to move forward for the businesses who are helping drive growth and create <coughs> jobs and help move forward for building the social inclusion and diversity, which is becoming the strength of our community so that we can continue to serve as a model for the rest of the country. Merci beaucoup. Uh, 
those will be negotiated uh, where we have provincial governments that want to step up with us and invest uh, in the long-term health of the people they represent. Thank you. Rock and roll. We'll go here. Oh, sorry. Go. Yeah. Sean Daly uh, here on behalf of the uh, Real Estate Board of Fredericton and the surrounding areas. And uh, of course, no surprise, my question is about housing. Um, we're uh, wondering if your party will commit to a comprehensive and transparent review of the mortgage stress test uh, for uh, uh, and implementing the necessary adjustments to support first-time home buyers and uh, new Canadians. Thanks very much, Sean, and, uh, and I've always appreciated the chance to meet with you and your colleagues uh, in Ottawa over these last couple of years, and sure. from you locally as well. Um, and there's no doubt we have a hot housing market here in Fredericton. And, and there are challenges that that, that sort of market creates uh, for young professionals and young families uh, in their purchasing a first home. What we have done as a government is introduce a home buyer's incentive to help make that easier. The CMHC is now uh, partnering with uh, first-time home buyers to help invest in that first home purchase. We have heard time and again the need to look at the stress test in the way that you that it is, as an Atlantic MP, we have uh, shared those differing views for our region as they, as they differ from our colleagues on the West Coast or, or in Toronto. Um, we have introduced different rules for some of the larger housing markets in this platform. And I think we'll continue to monitor the, 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 the statistics around how the housing markets are changed and any adjustments that we do make going forward. Um, so we're aware of the challenges that uh, the stress test causes in some markets. Trying to alleviate that with different incentives and different government support. And, and I would say we're always open to uh, revisiting that as uh, the market changes. Um, and, and I think with your continued advocacy and your continued engagement with folks like myself and, and my colleagues uh, at the cabinet table who who, who make these decisions, um, we'll, we'll be open and receptive uh, to, to, to continue to look at that. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Lindsay. Matt, four years ago, um, your party and yourself uh, talked about the last election being, in fact, promised the last election was going to be the last first pass of and a lot of Fredertonians voted strategically for you uh, with the hope of electoral reform. That has been sidelined or abandoned. With that, and, and with the threats on Canadian democracy, exploitive social media, uh, foreign intrusion, campaign finance, meeting updating, what are your priorities, priorities in terms of electoral reform, and what steps will you take to preserve Canadian democracy as we Appreciate it. Yeah. No, thanks very much for that question. Uh, so four years ago, when we were talking about uh, electoral reform, what I was hearing from folks is that they wanted their local representatives to have uh, more of a voice in the decisions that were made in Ottawa. Lo and behold, I get elected, and uh, one of my first committee assignments is on the special committee to examine electoral reform. Um, and so I had the chance to travel the country listen to the diverse perspectives of people, uh, to listen to experts who have studied this uh, issue intimately, both in Canada and abroad. And I feel at the end of that whole process that I was listened to in the decision that was finally made not to move forward with the new electoral system. And I was someone on the committee who stressed um, the need not to disrupt uh, the electoral system at this time, and I'll explain why. I asked every single expert I could on that committee to tell me if there was evidence that any other electoral system, any other voting system, would increase voter turnout. And everybody will submit to you that there is no one system that helps increase voter turnout on its own. Voter turnout is suffering from either modest or severe decline across the industrialized world, across democracies around the world. And, and some of those experts would also suggest that changing the system could lead to confusion and drive down voter turnout. 
and I don't think at a time where we should be focusing on getting 100% of people in communities out to vote, we should be changing the electoral system um, if it has the potential of driving down voter turnout. So my recommendation was not to move forward, and I feel like I was listened to as part of that process. Since then, we've seen uh, electoral reform fail in two provincial referendums. And quite frankly, I don't think there is a broad consensus or a broad appetite for us to focus on a new voting system at this time in Canadian history. What our focus has been is helping increase the franchise and franchise opportunities for more people in this country. We gave Elections Canada back its mandate to educate the general public about our electoral system and about how they can vote. We've introduced enhanced education uh, mandate for and, and provided funding for organizations like Civics who are driving the student vote campaigns in our public schools. Uh, Apathy is Born and Samara who are doing other great uh, community outreach around our democracy. And we've given the vote back to people living abroad and we've made it easier for people to show up without identification and be able to vote because it's everyone's right as a Canadian citizen to be able to cast a ballot. So helping increase um, opportunities for people to vote has been a priority. You'll also see, if, 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 uh, if you're paying close attention, that we've done a lot of work to protect the integrity of our system from foreign influence and from foreign attacks, both uh, physical and uh, through digital infrastructure. Uh, our uh, Department of Democratic <coughs> Institutions, Public Safety, and Foreign Affairs are working within country and with our allies around the world to protect our democracy from the types of threats that we've seen uh, come up in, in the news uh, in some recent elections. And, and we are, I mean, we are susceptible to those types of threats. So a lot of diligence has been placed and a lot of resources have been placed on making sure um, that our elections are, are safe from the types of disruption um, that would really throw our democracy into chaos. Um, so at a time where there's no clear consensus to move forward with a new voting system at a time where that's been rejected in two um, provincial referendums over the last year, at a time where we needed to focus on uh, a significant relationship with our largest trading partner to the south, as well as attacks from uh, foreign countries and third party actors. The focus has been on increasing voter turnout by giving more people the opportunity to vote and protecting the integrity of our system cyber attacks and other physical threats on our democracy. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Mr. Corsi. I'm Jennifer O'Donnell from Bio and Me. Um, you mentioned in your speech that um, if re-elected, your government would continue to invest in programs that would um, help businesses innovate. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to any particular initiatives or opportunities um, where our region Absolutely. Um, so uh, one of the things that we have committed to in the platform is to cut the corporate tax rate in half for any uh, company, any business that is investing in, uh, in the production or uh, in the manufacturing of zero emitting products or, or services. Um, we know that that's good for business and investment uh, in moving technology companies here. It's good for business growth in traditional resource sectors that want to get more efficient and effective and be a part of tackling climate change. So that's just one example. We're also committed to the economic development agencies that help spur business growth in our communities. We've invested across all the regional development agencies across the country, and that includes a total of $1.3 billion. Uh, and uh, when I hear conservative leaders say that they're going to cut $1.5 billion from corporate subsidies. There's only two places that that can come from. It comes from public services like healthcare or the transfers we provide for education in a place that is 
founded largely on its institution of education, or it comes from the economic development agencies that help support business growth in our regions. Uh, we'll continue to invest in organizations like ECOA who are supporting uh, strategic innovation in our region. We'll continue to support things like the Strategic Innovation Fund, uh, where there are significant dollars available, and we are making the case to go after those significant dollars to help grow our cybersecurity sector. And we have examples of how to do this because we've already seen significant investment come for smart grid technology in our communities. So ensuring that businesses who invest in green technology, who invest in lowering emissions by cutting their taxes and supporting them with uh, dollars through innovation funds and uh, business growth, and supporting the types of large programs that will invest in real job growth and innovative economies that can help also tackle climate change in our community are things that are part and parcel of our Atlantic growth strategy, which has a pillar focus on clean growth and investment in clean technology, in addition to innovation, in addition to bringing the human capital here through immigration and skills development for Canadians that will help drive that growth and, uh, and provide us with an even larger tax base to reinvest in the types of clean technologies that, uh, that I think we're primed to lead in here in Fredericton. Thank you. I'm going to go to Janet. I know I'm going to carry on a little bit. <laughs> There has been no greater champion in this country for increases in economic immigration than the business community, the Canadian Chamber, and, uh, and, and business leadership in this region and in other regions of the country. And because of your continued focus on building that human capital, we've been able um, to hold together the consensus in Canada, which is immigration is in our collective economic interest. But as you mentioned, Janet, that consensus is fragile, and it is under threat. When we see uh, Max Bernier put up billboards, or we listen to Andrew Scheer try to scapegoat refugees at our borders, what they demonstrate is that they don't understand the Canadian economy, and they certainly don't understand the vital necessity of immigration to the Atlantic economy. We have been clear from the very beginning that we will always stand up for our immigration system, which is lauded the world over as one of the strongest, most robust, and best examples of how to integrate people into community and into the local economy. And we will always stand firm by our uh, asylum system, which is also lauded the world over as one of the best for providing refuge and safe haven for those who are persecuted and those who need it. So I always ask uh, the business community to be uh, forceful and to have a voice when you hear the sort of fear mongering that appears on billboards or the sorts of disinformation that appears about the situation of folks who are arriving looking for safe haven at our borders. We have a system in place that properly vets these people, that ensures that they are not a security risk to our country, and if they are deserving of our protection, Canada will always provide 
protection to those who need it. Part of what we've done as well to ensure that we have a safe and secure border is we've reinvested the half a billion dollars that were cut from our public safety agencies over the course of Stephen Harper's government. He cut from the Canadian Border Service Agency, he cut from the ICMP, and he cut from other security and intelligence agencies that can help ensure that our borders are strong and that we have the resources there to, uh, to help support the growth of our immigration system. Now when it comes to supporting entrepreneurs uh, in the immigration scene, I'm looking at my friend Chris at the back there because he, uh, he's, uh, he's been persistent in reminding me that we still have work to do to help reduce the backlogs in some of the streams uh, that will help support growth in communities like Fredericton. We've made significant advancements in reducing backlogs across a number of different economic immigration streams. We've helped reduce the significant backlog in family class streams, which are helping spouses and parents and grandparents get into this country. And we will maintain our leadership as, as a leader on refugees. But we do have to now add resources to <coughs> programs like our uh, startup visa uh, stream. And we need provincial governments to work with us to help build their capacity on entrepreneurship streams. Where it comes to IRCC, Immigration Refugee Canada, funding for um, economic development in the communities. You're right, Janet, our focus over these last four years has been on growing the supports we provide for settlement services. And we've grown those supports across the country by over 30% to make sure that agencies that support um, the settlement and, uh, and, and basic skills training for people in this community are able uh, to operate well. But I'm excited at some of the inroads we've made in supporting women newcomers. I'm excited at some of the inroads we've made in supporting um, developments in economic growth in rural and remote communities based largely on what we've been able to accomplish through this Atlantic Immigration Pilot. And I think partnerships between Immigration and Refugees Canada and ACOA can help build uh, more support for newcomers when they land to build a business and grow that business and help employ people and, and I think newcomers should be eligible for this new $50,000 startup program that we're going to deploy to help small businesses uh, here locally. We also have a tremendous talent pool with our international students locally. And uh, I've been pleased that as part of the development of the local immigration strategy, folks at Ignite, the Chamber, and City Hall, and the other um, stakeholders that are a part of that have focused on um, better supports and uh, better workforce integration for international students. Uh, the post-grad work permit that we put in place is a good step in helping an international students stay. Um, their ability to apply through the Atlantic Immigration Pilot is a good step. But like so many things uh, in government and in community, the work is never done. We need to keep working together to, uh, to take those next steps. You don't have to convince me that uh, our greatest opportunity for long-term success in this community is in welcoming more people here and in making sure that they have the supports that they need to contribute to our uh, business growth and to our economic success. Thank you. Uh, For the first time in many decades, the federal government is back in the business of housing. We have a $15 billion housing strategy that is meant to address the, the diversity of needs in communities across this country. Here locally, we know that we need more housing stock, period. We know that we have a challenge with homelessness and we need more affordable and low income housing and, and, uh, and we need to support agencies who do good work helping provide shelter, uh, permanent shelter,
for the people who need it. And we know that when we can get those folks on your roof, then we can provide them supports to the mental health system, the addiction system, and the other employment uh, and, uh, and social supports that they need. We have a growing newcomer population, and we know that our housing stock isn't the most accommodating to people who come here with four, five, six, seven, eight children. And so we need to support our local developers in investing in um, a whole variety of, of housing stock. We have an aging population, so we need to ensure that uh, we have appropriate housing for seniors who need to downsize and, and take care of, of less property themselves. Um, we need the support of the local community to identify immediate housing needs. We need the provincial government to decide that these are priorities, and we have the federal dollars available through bilateral agreements with the provincial government because of our uh, $15 billion housing strategy. And there are also levers through the Canadian Housing and Mortgage Corporation, it's the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, to the co-investment fund that I know is supporting growth for organizations like Habitat for Humanity, um, where we can leverage those dollars, identify immediate needs, and help our local community build for the medium and long term. I think it's going to be one of the pressing issues that we face over the coming years. Um, and, uh, and I know we all have a variety of different infrastructure priorities in this community, but if we can't house people and house them adequately, um, I'm not sure that uh, we need to be talking about some of the other recreational and cultural pieces of infrastructure uh, that some folks in this community think are more important. <coughs> we've, got to, we've got to get people off the street and ensure, <coughs> ensure adequate housing for newcomer and aging populations. And we've got to make sure that we raise our housing stock in general because uh, as the economy grows, more people are going to come here and they need a place to live. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Louisa. I'm the first young international student graduate who stayed here 20 years, so good example. But I first want to thank you and your government for the Health Canada one time fund in regards to substance misuse treatment that is available. I've been working very closely with a doctor in the community who really cares about increasing the access for treatment because the reality is it's growing in New Brunswick and unless we address this challenging situation, we're still going to have the problem of housing, employment, and all of those things. So I just wanted to know your personal perspective in how to create a robust approach to substance misuse treatment. Um. <coughs> Well, first of all, uh, thanks very much, and, and, um, and there's no doubt that uh, we do face some serious challenge uh, with uh, the spread of opioids across our country, for example. And uh, I've met uh, and numerous times with folks at the community health clinic who are the front line in dealing with people who are challenged with different substance, substance abuse programs. Um, our investments in um, health care need to ensure that our governments can hire the healthcare professionals that they need to reduce wait times. And we also need to find innovative ways to invest in the sorts of safe spaces that allow people to get the treatment they need. Housing is an important part of this equation. Um, more investment in mental health is an important part of this equation. Um, and treating substance abuse issues as a public health matter and not a criminal matter uh, is part of an approach that we have already embarked on and that um, with the leadership of my colleague and monk Jean-Pierre Patel, our, our health minister, that we are continuing to invest in. Uh, we all have a role to play at the community, provincial, and federal level in addressing these issues. Uh, they are complex issues, uh, but investments in housing, investments in public health institutions, investments in mental health and addiction services, and investments in public sensitization that destigmatizes some of the challenges that these people face are all tremendously important. Um, and I grew up in a household with a, a mother who is a teacher of uh, students with educational challenges, and a father who is a probation officer with young offenders who ran into trouble with the law. And I understand it takes empathy to understand the stories of how people fall into the challenges that they fall into. And it takes allyship to help pull them out of those challenges. Um, 
it's challenging as a federal representative to be gone half the time and to miss out on some of the on the ground things that happen in this community. But what I do, um, but what I do take note of is when I am here, there are tremendous people in this community who can help uh, inform me of what's going on on the ground. And quite frankly, those people are the best people uh, to support because they are the ones uh, who will do the work to help address uh, issues um, that are a cause of and that create greater issues due to substance abuse. Thank you. Larry. Uh, well, thank, thank you, Matt, for being here. And, and first and foremost, uh, you know, those that, that offer to provide service to Canadians through, you know, my name is Paul Fisher. sacrifices that the politician made. Uh, two questions. One is a bit of a follow-up on the on the immigration uh, story and the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program. Um, there's there's often changes in program at a provincial level. And sometimes those changes keep provinces in some to some sense competitive with each other uh, through different policies that they introduce. So I'm wondering what your thoughts would be very much like the Atlantic Growth Strategy had was more of a private advisory board that would not have directly oversight, uh, but would actually inform or um, you know provide input to you know in this case Kettle as an example of, of what to and maybe not to do in terms of those policy changes. That's the first question. Second question uh, that's been posed to me in a number of cases over the last two or three days, or the last couple of days actually, um, like your thoughts on on the nine point five billion. On, on, the, on the first issue, the issue of, or the idea of having um, business leadership and uh, private sector leadership on, as an advisory role to provincial and federal governments as it relates to our immigration needs, I'd be happy to work on that uh, on that position paper and advance that um, at at at, uh, at the Atlantic Growth Strategy level as it relates specifically to immigration. Um, folks in this community have done great job of developing a collaborative table to address the needs here in Fredericton. And I know there are other communities uh, in the province and across Atlantic Canada who are doing good work. Not as good as the work that people in Fredericton are doing, but still pretty good work um, to, uh, to work uh, collaboratively on these issues. And, I, and I'd be happy to work, uh, whether it was with Ignite Fredericton or with the Immigration Fredericton Task Force, to help advance that sort of uh, advisory role to both PETL and to uh, IRCC as well. On the second issue of um, the finances of the country, uh, Canada remains to be uh, lauded as having one of the strongest uh, economic records across the world. We are one of only two countries um, that the bond rating agencies provide a AAA rating within the G7 ourselves in Germany. And we're only one of a handful of countries across the world to, to be um, lauded as having a stable economy. And I believe that's because we, we chose, and we continue to choose, to invest in people and in their affordability. We choose to invest in important infrastructure that makes our communities safer and that helps tackle climate change at the same time and provide the type of opportunities <coughs> for um, healthy and uh, healthy living and because we've invested in the competitiveness of our business community. So the choice that, um, that we put on offer for Canadians is to continue to invest in the things that are helping grow our economy uh, faster than it has um, at any point over the last 15 years. And as we do that, we'll keep our eyes on the most important indicator that economists talk about which is the size of our debt relative to the size of our economy. And what we've seen over the last couple of years is that our debt as a portion of our GDP, as the size of our economy, continues to get smaller. It's now less than a third of the size of our economy, and it's on a steady downward uh, climb. Descent, sorry. 
steady downward descent. So we'll keep our eye on that indicator. But when I talk to uh, people uh, in rooms like this, um, I, I listen and, and you keep telling me and, and, and we've made the choice to move ahead in what you're asking for, which is investment, which is investment in things like cybersecurity here locally, which is investment in a smart grid technology, which in New Brunswick, because we've been able to leverage $40 million in federal investment, we've seen another $60 million come in through companies like Siemens and, and Amera, and it's creating jobs with those companies and at NB Power. So our focus will be on responsible economic growth, job creation, and helping lift people out of poverty, which puts more money into their pockets, pockets to spend in the community, and also, when we lift people out of poverty, we reduce costs on our acute health care system and on other social supports. And we do that in a responsible way while ensuring that uh, our debt as a portion of our economy <coughs> continues to get smaller and smaller. And we'll listen to the international experts on this who are telling us that we are in a stable position, one of a handful of countries around the world that is in a stable position and that is a model for a place where people can invest, grow their businesses and create jobs. Any other questions? Uh, what is the single biggest issue for the space at the moment, and how do you plan to do it? Um, Fredericton has all the key ingredients for economic growth uh, to become more inclusive socially and to build on our diversity. Uh, we're, we're home to a well educated, trained, bilingual uh, public service and workforce. We're home to world-class post-secondary institutions, a leader in liberal arts, Canada's most entrepreneurial university, uh, a tremendous community college and college of craft and design, and many other private institutions. We have one of the largest training centers, military training centers among our NATO allies, the second largest military base in the country, home of Canada's army. We've got a great business community, a burgeoning entrepreneurial ecosystem that it now has a national reputation for being a part of Canada's startup capital, and tremendous opportunity in cybersecurity and smart grid technology. And I know uh, shortly we'll be talking about more innovative opportunities uh, in Fredericton and in our surrounding communities. So we have all of those things going for us. The key challenge we face is our population our ability to fill the labor demands that those institutions help provide within our job market. And so for me, skills development for people here locally and investing in things like CAN code and opportunities for young people to learn the digital skills they need in school and investing in immigration and retention of, of the skilled workforce here in our region is the number one issue that, uh, that I think we should be talking about. We've got all the opportunity here, and we have the demand, because we're gonna lose 100,000 uh, New Brunswickers from the workforce over the next <coughs> 10 years. Uh, and if we're going to invest in those innovative opportunities and the jobs they create, we need to have the people here, we need to bring them here, we need to keep them here, and we need to get their kids in school so that they integrate into the community, and so that those kids grow up as well. To the uh, to the job market when they're prepared. Short answer: immigration. <laughs>
If you haven't already bought a ticket, just a reminder, we are hosting our annual Business Excellence Awards this coming Thursday at the Delta. Uh, there are still a limited number of tickets available, and it is a highlight of our calendar and a really great evening, so I encourage you to attend that. And last but not least, thanks again once again to our venue sponsor, the Plant Hatch, and our refreshment sponsor, the Fredericton, the Real Estate Board of Fredericton Area. Thank you everyone for attending.